All right. Hey, good morning, church. Good to see everybody in God's house today. Wasn't that great worship? Man, we are so blessed. Thank you, Dots and the band and everybody. Man, we are blessed. All right. Well, hey, you know, when I was a little kid, I loved sports. And um, one of the sports that I, I, I really enjoyed was Little League Baseball. And when I first started, I don't know, I was in maybe first or second grade, and they put me out in the outfield. That was fine, you know. They put me in right field, never got a ball. That was okay. I had fun. And I, as I got a little bit better over the years, I eventually worked my way into the infield. That was a big deal to me. And, and they put me at first base. So ha- had a great time there. And then I remember in sixth grade, um, on our team, our catcher, you know, he, he'd gone into uh, to junior high, and, and I thought, oh, I, I think it'd be fun to play catcher. So I remember sitting down with my mom saying, Mom, I, I want to go out for catcher this year. And, and my mother got very concerned. She said, honey, you've always played safe positions, <laughs> like the outfield and, and first base. I'm concerned about catcher. Won't you get hurt? I mean... You know, it seems like a rough position. I said, no, Mom, I'll be okay. Now, you got to realize, I was just a skinny beanpole, all right? And, and I was pretty light. And uh, you know, probably the catcher's equipment weighed more than I did, okay? Um, so my mom was concerned for my safety, but, you know, my dad and I were able to, to talk her into it. So we got into that little league season, And uh, sure enough, when the other coaches saw, you know, how kind of light I was behind the plate, they would always tell their players, listen, if if you're on base and if it looks like it's going to be a close one at home plate, just plow that kid over. Just plow the catcher over. He will will fly away like a feather, all right? Not not a problem. And I experienced that happened a lot, okay? I remember the names of the kids that plowed me down in sixth grade. And my mother is dying the whole season, just so afraid that I am not going to see my seventh grade year playing catcher in Little League, all right? But probably the worst thing that happened is I remember one game, and you know, back then, I guess they still do it in the pros, the batters, they get up there and they hit the ball, and what does the catcher do? You rip the mask off your face so you can see where the ball went, right? So I remember catching in one game, and this kid gets up there, and he, and he hits the ball, right? Got a good hit. And so I whipped my mask off to see where it went. Well, this kid, he swung through. He hung onto the bat, and then he let it go. Bam! Nailed me right in the face. And that's why I look the way I do today. <laughs> it's a scary thing. My whole face is off center and just, man... My mother thought I had a big old black eye. My nose was bleeding. My lips were cut open. And she was, she, she was in my little league coach's face immediately. All right, immediately. Boy, mom had some fears with me uh, playing catcher in little league. But, you know, fear is not always a bad thing. I mean, fear can keep us safe. Fear can keep us healthy. But, you know... Uh, I've also seen fear keep people from a lot of joy in their lives as well. Experiencing joy with, uh, with their families and their friends. Uh, not experiencing that joy uh, as far as n- not having the courage to go out and experience new opportunities. The most important is I've seen fear um, steal the joy of people in their relationship with God. So individuals, families, businesses, and churches, I've seen fail to move forward because of fear or foolishness rather than than making wise and decisions based on faith, not fear. So we're going to talk about that uh, this morning, what the Bible has to say with making decisions, not from fear, not from foolishness, but from a position of faith. Before we go on, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, it is such an honor to be in your house today. 
We can feel the presence of your Holy Spirit with us. Matter of fact, you tell us with where two or three are gathered in your name, there is your presence also. So we, we recognize your Holy Spirit among us. As we continue to talk about facing life with faith, all of us uh, are probably considering different decisions, different levels. Some are small, some are huge. How do we, how do we put our fears away and approach those, <clears throat> those decisions with faith? God, lead us this morning as we study your word. In your name we pray. And everybody said, <clears throat> amen. All right. Well, I've entitled this message, Making Decisions, Fear, Facts, and Faith. Let's talk about fear for a moment. What can fear do? Fear can, can paralyze us from acting. Fear can freeze us from moving forward. And I can't think of a better example than the children of Israel in the Old Testament They had been slaves of the Egyptians. The Egyptians had worked them hard to help build their society. They they were slaves. And that was going on for years and years and years. And so God rose up Moses to be a deliverer for his people. And yet Pharaoh, if you remember the story, didn't want his slaves to leave. And so what did God do? He sent ten plagues upon the Egyptian people. And finally, Pharaoh let the Hebrews go. Then almost immediately as he let them go, he regretted the decision. And so he chased after them in the desert. He sent his armies and his chariots and his warriors to take them out. And this is where we pick up our story in the book of Exodus chapter 14. What can fear do to us? Well, like the Israelites, it can make us skeptical. Fear can make us skeptical. It says in verses 10 to 11, Now when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. They were terrified. And wouldn't you be? seeing this army coming after you, thinking, I'm going to die. And so, and the people of Israel, what did they do? They, they cried out to the Lord to save them. And then they look at Moses. <laughs> There's got to be somebody to blame. There's got to be a scapegoat somewhere. And they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Moses, do you see the skepticism there? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? They were skeptical that God was in this whole deliverance thing, that he really wanted to to make them a nation of their own. They were skeptical of Moses' leadership and God's presence and provision with them. You know, When we're afraid, we can begin to become skeptical. We can doubt ourselves, others, and even God. What else can fear do? Fear can make us stubborn. And the Israelites reflected that attitude as well. In verse 12, they're continuing on in blaming Moses, in, in, in turning their frustration and fear towards him. And they said, is not this what we said to you in Egypt, Moses? Leave us alone. Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. They were stubborn. They said, we told you that we didn't want to go. We were comfortable here. Yes, we were slaves. Yes, they worked us hard. But at least we didn't have armies attacking us. We had food. We had water. And God was leading them out into the unknown. And fear had caused them to become stubborn. And that can cause us to be stubborn as well. We can resist change. Because of the fear of the unknown. And there's a final thing that fear can do. Fear can make us short-sighted. Fear can make us short-sighted. The people went on to say, 
you know, Moses, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the wilderness. All they could see was what they had right in front of them. You know, it would have been better if we could have just served the Egyptians for the rest of our lives and that our children, our grandchildren, and their children, that we would just remain slaves of the Egyptians. That's all they could see was the here and now. The present, their fear had blinded them. They were short-sighted. And in the same way, short-sightedness can keep you and I from dreaming, from seeing new possibilities, from trying new things. Well, how did Moses respond? He responded in faith. And he said this in verses 13 and 14. Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you'll never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is be still. Can you do that, Israelites? (laughs) Fear had overpowered them. Fear had frozen them from being able to respond to a very, very difficult situation. Now, I'm sure that for many of us, we are considering different decisions today. Some of our decisions (laughs) aren't, aren't huge. You know, do I rebuild the fence at the house or not? Hmm, let me ponder that. Lord, what dost thou think? You know, right? So... I mean, little decisions. And then they're big decisions. Do I take that new job opportunity? Do I move my family, uproot my teenagers to another community? Big decisions like that. Well, how do we put aside our fears, not respond in foolishness, but respond in faith? That's what I want to talk about in this next part of our message. How do we process a decision that we're considering? Surrounded by faith throughout the whole thing. And, and the first thing we do is this. We need to get information. We need information. And to get information, we get the facts. We get the facts. Now, let me stop right here. It doesn't mean that you're not spiritual if you want to get the facts, okay? <laughs> I've, I've met a lot of Christians who, who want to just kind of run out. And they said, God told me, let's go. I said, did you consider that? Did you get the facts? No, but I know God wants me to do this, right? Listen, getting the facts is not unspiritual. It's smart. As a matter of fact, ignorance often accompanies fear, right? Let me ask you a question. You ever been afraid of something? But then once you were in the middle of it, you looked around and you thought, hey, this isn't so bad. This is okay, right? Because you got information, I remember when we were called to Calvary, right, Northern California. I, my wife and I, we, re, we had never lived in Northern California. We were always in, I know, Southern California. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we, we were L.A., Orange County, San Diego, all the places you want to move. But anyway, that's where we lived, okay? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So... So we get called to Calvary in Northern California to this city called Man, Manteca, all right? And uh, we didn't know how to pronounce this place or anything, right? And, and there was all the unknown. And, 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 and now that we've been here a while, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. You guys are okay. You guys are okay. We'll hang out with you, okay? I mean, it's, it's an all right. Now, now when the when the almond trees are blossoming, I got to tell you, that gets to my sinuses a little bit, all right? So if you, if you see me choking up here trying to get through my sermon, it's all y'all's fault, all right? It's all the farmers, all the almond trees. But, but we didn't know anything about Manteca. But now that we've been here, man, we love this place. We love the people here in this town. We, we got the facts. We got some information. It's a way to exercise our faith. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs Chapter 13, verse 16. Every prudent man or woman acts with knowledge, but a fool 
flaunts his folly. Say, I see faith there. It says, listen, you want to be prudent? You want to be wise? You act not on ignorance. You act with knowledge. It's the fool who just takes off without getting the information and, and the facts. You know, you might be afraid of something coming up in your life. Maybe it's a surgery. Get the facts. You might be afraid of getting that vaccine. Get the facts on it. You might have fears concerning a certain college to attend. If you're a student or thinking about going back to school, it might be a new job opportunity. It could be uh, stepping out in a new ministry here at the church or somewhere else. You might be considering whether you should invest your funds in, in this investment opportunity or, or that one. Uh, get the facts. Put away fear. Exercise faith. And I say, well, where do I get the facts, Pastor? You got a phone? We got an internet. You've got a whole dictionary encyclopedia at your fingertips. Get some facts. Get some figures. Get the updated information on whatever you might be considering. Talk to other people who have been there before. Get as much information as you can. God can work in and through your life through faith when you do that. So when we moved here, uh, we rented a place for a while, and then we were looking for a home, looking for a neighborhood, and we tried to get the facts. We tried to get as much information as we could, and, and we bought a home. And I remember uh, here at church, someone came up to me and said, Hey, I heard you got a house. Where would you get your house? And I told him where we lived. And he goes, oh, you got a house in the floodplain. Excuse me? What? Did you just say flood? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what's your address? Oh, yeah, I used to work around there. You're right, the floodplain. Big smile on his face. I'm like, what? I didn't get all the facts. And now I'm a proud owner of flood insurance. You know, get the facts, get the facts, right? There was a group of Jews who were living in the Greek city of Berea, kind of by Thessalonica, and Paul got kind of kicked out of Thessalonica. They weren't treating him very well, and so he ends up in Berea. And the apostle Paul, the first thing he would do is go to the Jewish synagogue and would tell them about Jesus, that, hey, their Messiah had come. And it tells us in the book of Acts, verses, chapter 17, starting at verse 11, now these Jews in Berea, well, they were, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they received the word of Paul about the gospel of Jesus with all eagerness. And what did they do? Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things that Paul was saying about Jesus that the Messiah had really come, were so. They were taking, I assume, some of these Old Testament scrolls they might have been able to get their hands upon. And they were remembering the stories. They were trying to, to connect the dots. Could this Jesus be the Messiah that we've been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds of years? And as Paul taught them, the Bible says they believed. Many of the prominent women gave their faith to Jesus, and so did some men. They got the facts. Second thing we can do in making decisions is evaluation. We count the cost. We count the cost. We, we consider the time it's going to take if we move forward in this particular opportunity. Uh, we think about the money that it might cost us. We consider the physical energy that it might take. We consider the emotional energy, um, how it might affect our relationships. Uh, we have to consider if any adjustments might be needed. If we were to do this, then does that mean that we're going to have to let go of something else in our lives so our schedules aren't crazy? Are the benefits going to be worth it if we move forward in a certain decision? Jesus taught this, uh, and I've shared this passage several times over the last couple of months because it's just so darn good. 
And he was teaching the people, saying, listen, you want to follow me? You want to be one of my disciples? You better count the cost. Salvation is free. Discipleship costs everything. You're going to have to commit yourself to me. But then he gave this brilliant illustration that I think can be applied, obviously, to discipleship, following Jesus, but to so many other aspects of our lives. And he says this in Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 28. Jesus says, for which of you desiring to build a tower or a building okay, doesn't first sit down and count the cost? Jesus said that. You're going to make a decision? You're going to build a building? You're not just going to go halfway and just go see what happens? No, you're going to sit down. You're going to count the cost. That's just smart. That's just using the brains that God gave you. This is from the words of Jesus. And you, you, you determine whether you have enough to complete the building or not. Do I have enough money? Do I have enough resources? Verse 29, otherwise... When you've laid the foundation and you're not able to finish it, everybody who sees will begin to mock, saying, this man began to build and wasn't able to finish. <laughs> he didn't think it through, did he? He didn't get all the facts. He didn't count the cost. Jesus gives another example. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. That's the principle. We count the cost. Now that goes for decisions regarding our schooling, our education, for ourselves, for our kids, maybe going into business for ourselves, maybe a purchase we're considering, maybe a ministry we're thinking about all kinds of different situations. You know, uh, I'm a father of, of four kids. And um, my youngest one, Sophia, she's with us here at Calvary in Manteca. And I remember when she was born, you know, my wife and I are dreaming about, uh, about our little daughter and, and how we'd like to raise her. And my wife grew up playing piano. Her and all of her sisters took piano lessons. And I remember my wife Harriet said, she's going to have piano lessons. I said, oh, yeah? Well, I play guitar. And she's going to learn how to play guitar too, okay? And my wife said, you're on. So we had to count the cost, though. H having uh, music as a part of our kids' lives, we've seen a lot of benefits and in our own lives, but there would be a cost involved. Um, we had to make sure we had my parents' old stand-up piano in the house so she could learn. We had to bring in piano teachers and pay for private lessons and go to exciting piano recitals, um, all those type of things. A and then it was my turn. So I went out and got her a little starter guitar and taught her how many chords? That's right, my four chords, okay? I taught her my four chords, started to teach her, you know, a couple of songs, and she was learning. She got better, and then the cost increased. I went out and, and drove hours to go get a great deal on this really nice guitar. And, and then I remember taking her to rehearsals where her youth pastor at her former church was teaching her. But here's the thing. Was it worth the cost? Absolutely. My daughter now can play piano and she can play guitar. She helps lead worship on guitar and piano in the high school group and she helps lead in our adult services. It's awesome to see God take that and is working faith in her life. So we need to count the cost. But as I say that, we also need to remember, is our heart in the right place? Is it just because I wanted a kid who could, you know, be a rock star? A absolutely not. I wanted a kid who would be able to experience God in another way than just Bible studies. That she could actually sing and play an instrument and be able to connect with God in that way and help others too. And so in our decisions, the question is, have we involved God? We can get all the facts. 
we can count the cost, but are we doing this on our own? Or have we got, brought God into the picture? In the book of Proverbs, again, it tells us in chapter 21, verse 2, the way of a man or woman is right in their own eyes. A lot of times we can make decisions and start plowing forward, right? And in our own eyes, yeah, it's good. This is justified. I can justify that turbo Porsche I'm going to buy, right? You know, or whatever. We can justify things. But the Lord weighs the heart. So we need to remember that. Whatever decision we are thinking about, at whatever level, include God. Because he knows our hearts. <laughs> are we making these decisions out of selfishness, out of pride, some other motivation that might hurt another person or not honor God? So let's move on. How do I process a decision that I'm considering? Well, information, we get the facts. Evaluation, we count the cost. Number three, preparation. We plan our steps. Now, <laughs> planning is pretty important. I mean, life is not like action heroes, right? I don't know about you, I love action movies. Star Wars and, and all the Marvel action movies, and it seems like every time they get in a jam, they get out of it, right? The action heroes, they always win. They always come out smelling like roses. My, my, my favorite, personal favorite, above Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Aquaman, whatever. My favorite action hero is Indiana Jones, okay? I love Indiana Jones. I, if I had another life, I would be Indiana Jones for Jesus, okay? That, that would be me. And um, I love Harrison Ford. He's in the middle of something with Indiana Jones, and he's in a pickle. Uh, you, you, it looks like everybody's going to come on him. He's going to get wiped out. And his, and his, and his buddy in, in the movie says, Indy, what's the plan? And he looks at him, he says, I don't got a plan. I'm just making this up as I go, right? And he always gets out of it. It always works out great. Well, listen, approaching life with that mindset, not very smart. Um, <laughs> not the best plan for success. And most importantly, uh, just rolling around without a plan, that, that fails to exercise faith in God. I love the way Rick Warren, pastor down at Saddleback Church, said at one time, hey, listen, failing to plan is planning to fail. Okay? Think of it that way. Failing to plan, that's just planning to fail. There's nothing spiritual in not planning. God honors preparation. That means planning our steps. Again, we go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, in verse 15. It says this, the simple believes everything, but the prudent, they give thought to their steps. See, some people, they'll just believe anything. They'll just run off and make foolish decisions. But people who are prudent, who are mature, who are responsible, they are going to give thought to their steps. That word thought means that they will be discerning. They will act with understanding. They'll perceive challenges that they might face in a certain decision. They'll gather resources. They'll have a strategy. They'll think through the details. Hmm. You know, right now, I'm taking our staff through. We are praying about, and I'm speaking with different people about possibly um, starting a new service midweek in the fall. A lot of people... Um, work on Sundays. A lot of people have kids who have sports on Sundays. Um, people who are out of town. So if we were able to offer a midweek service, that can make a connection with a lot of people. So right now, we're trying to get the facts, get all the information. We're trying to count the cost as we prepare. We're trying to plan our steps to see if the Lord would open up that door for Calvary. You know, there are thousands of homes being built in Manteca. Manteca's growing. And God has just been speaking to me like, you know what? A lot of those folks might be commuting. And they might be spending four to five hours a day on the road. 
They might not be as open to church on a Sunday. They might want to spend that time with their families or do other things, but they might come on a midweek. So we're praying about that. And you might want to pray about that too. But we're trying to apply the things that we're talking about today. Put some thought into it, some discernment. We don't want to just act haphazardly. We want to act with understanding. And planning our steps can apply, again, in so many areas of life. In our education and raising our kids, our careers, dreams for the future, our finances, our retirement plans, and our ministries. And Jesus gave an example of this, didn't he? He had died on the cross. He had rose again. And he gathered his disciples for one last time before he ascended to heaven. And what did Jesus do? Well, see you guys. Nice knowing you. Bye-bye. No. He didn't say that. Jesus gave his disciples a very specific plan for world evangelization. Evangelization. To share with the world who he was. And how the world might be forgiven of their sins. Do you remember that? It was in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Jesus said, you're going to receive power. The Greek word is dunamis. We get our word dynamite from it. You're going to get this dynamite power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I'm not going to leave you out here on your own to sink or swim. No, I'm going to provide for you. I am going to fill you with the Holy Spirit, and you're going to receive power. And you're going to be my witnesses and this is the plan Jesus gave them. First, right here in Jerusalem, center of, of Judaism. You're going to tell them that their Messiah has come. And they need to trust in him. Then we're going to spread out to, to the larger community of, of Judea, southern Israel. And then I want you to go into Samaria, kind of a, a cross-cultural situation. They were half Jews. Tell them that their Messiah has come, that God loves them. And finally, to the ends of the earth. Do you see? And the book of Acts takes that plan. And we went through Acts, but if you read through it, you'll see how Jesus' plan was worked out through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the disciples and his followers. It began in the center of Judaism. And then the book of Acts takes you all the way to the spread of the gospel to the center of world power in Rome as the church was established there. Jesus had a plan. And as we talk about plans, talk about details and facts, again, we can never leave God out of the process. Amen, church? Because I don't know about you, but when I'm considering these big plans and decisions, I can get nervous. I can get anxious. And what does the Bible tell me in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God will surpass all understanding and will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, we plan our steps. We give it to God in prayer. And we, finally, we seek wise counsel and advice as we do this. That's exercising faith too. It tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verse 22, without counsel, plans fail. You ever do something just on your own, and it was a complete miserable failure? You're wondering why? Then you talk to a buddy. Oh, yeah, I tried that once. It was a total failure. You should have done it this way. (laughs) Oh, I wish I would have talked to you before. Without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. It's not unspiritual to seek out trusted Christian friends who have wisdom and share with them what you're considering. 
what your plans are, what you feel God might be speaking to you about. Uh, Maybe they've done it before. Maybe they've gone down that road before. Maybe they know what works and what doesn't work, if it's worth the effort or the risk. There's wisdom in that, folks. It's a way to exercise our faith. All right, so we've been in the process. We've gathered the information. We've done our evaluation. We've worked on our preparation. Now, when do we act in faith? When do we pull the trigger? Well, that's the final step. When do we act in faith? That's initiation. Initiation. That's where we let go and launch out. The decision we might be considering, it still might be scary. There still might be some unknowns. But we can't grab a hold of what's ahead until we let go of what we got, right? I love the picture of trapeze artists on the high wire act, right? And they they time, they time their swings on the bars just so that as as one is coming up, the other is able to release. And in midair, they're able to grab each other's wrists. But you got to let go before you can launch out and take a hold of what that next step, that next opportunity might be. So my question is, what do you need to let go of? What do you need to let go of to launch out in that decision that you're considering? For some, it might be your past. For some, it might be your doubts and fears. Some might need to let go of of bitterness and forgive before they can move forward. Others need to let go of just what's comfortable. (laughs) We like what we know. How many of you are sitting in the same seat you sit in every Sunday when you come? (laughs) You don't have to raise your hands. I know you're all in the exact same seats. But um, we like what's comfortable, right? We like what's comfortable, Sometimes we got to let go to experience all God has for us. Nehemiah was a man who lived in the post-exilic period of Israel's history. That means that he was a child of the generation that was conquered by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and the best of the best were hauled away to their countries in an exile. And Nehemiah was in Persia at the time, modern-day Iran, And he was apparently a very responsible, wise, mature person because he was the king's cupbearer. They had a lot of influence with the king, the conquering king at the time of Persia. And being the cupbearer, he would taste the king's food before he ate it. Not sure that's a job I would want, but uh, this was his job. And he got word from his brother who had visited Israel. He said, give me a report. What's the old country like? And his brother said, Jerusalem is in ruins. The walls have been broken down. The gates have been burned. Our nation is in shame and disgrace. And that cut Nehemiah to the heart. He prayed to God. He said, what can I do? How can you use me, Lord, to help restore the dignity of Israel, your people? And so he went to the king. He put his fears away. And he said, O king of Persia, conquering, powerful king, will you allow me to go back to the nation of my people, the Jews of Israel, Will you allow me to rebuild their capital city? Will you supply me with letters of protection, with with materials like timber? And the king said, go. And so Nehemiah went to Israel. He went to Jerusalem, and he did his homework. He went through the whole process that that we talked about. He went out and he got the facts. He counted the cost. He made plans and preparations, and then he got the people together. 
And he said this in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Nehemiah says, then I said to them, you see the trouble that we're in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision and shame from the other nations. Verse 18, and I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Nehemiah inspired the people. He had a plan. And they were able to rebuild the walls and the gates of Jerusalem in only 52 days. And the nation returned. Wow. Considering a decision? You got some before you that you're not quite sure of? I want to encourage you. Put your fears aside. Replace it with faith. Gather the information. Do the evaluation. Make your preparations. And then initiate, trusting that the Lord is with you and guiding you each step of the way. Let's talk with God. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. Thank you that your word encourages us to be responsible with the decisions that we make, to use the brains and the experience that you've given us. That can be all the ways that we could exercise faith. I trust that you'll be with us, Lord, and we would honor you in our lives and the decisions that we make. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.